When it comes to uh, the existence of God, sometimes people will phrase it this way. They will say, well, look, if there was proof, if I had some sort of proof that God existed, then I would believe. Uh, I disagree. <laughs> I completely disagree. I think if you had proof, I think it would make very little difference uh, that, 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 you, that God exists at all. If we could somehow scientifically prove there's a, uh, an energy source or a God particle, there have been different things that have been um, that have more or less been proposed, or if we could prove it scientifically, if we could in some way measure, I think it would make absolutely zero difference to your day. Zero. Because our faith goes beyond science. Faith goes beyond reason. It's reasonable. So, okay, we have, we have uh, superstition, which is just you see a black cat and suddenly your bank investments are going to go worse because a black feline passed outside your door. Explain to me how that works. That's complete superstition. That's rubbish, right? Then you've got, you've got science, which is you know, numbers and facts and things balancing out and all that kind of thing, okay? Which is reasonable, all good. Uh, but then you've got faith, which is reasonable plus some, okay? It goes beyond reason. It's not superstition. Superstition is ridiculous stuff. You know, black, uh, black cats, ladders, broken mirrors, all the number 13. I have, I have a friend who um, has a couple of properties and he was just telling me that um, he had a house. The house before it was 12, the house after it was 14. He had to call his house 12B because if you have a house 13, people will not rent it. They won't rent your house because it's, it's, it's an unlucky number. Absolute superstitious rubbish. Anyway, point being though, like I said, we should not equate faith with superstition. They're completely different. Um, as regards our faith, we are supposed to delve into these mysteries with our reason, but not be limited by our reason, okay? So uh, like the, the, the existence of God and things, even if we could quantify them, it would make no difference. It's not like people would convert in hordes if we could suddenly prove the existence of God scientifically. It would make no difference at all. It wouldn't. Look at our gospel today. So the people see this miracle. They, these two demoniacs, no one would go near them because they were such fierce creatures, characters. We can imagine, you know, if you're living in tombs, you probably, your behavior is going to be less than welcoming. Uh, your odor might be less than ideal. Uh, you know, like there's going to be all, like the horrific characters, right? They're, like people wouldn't have approached easily, or if they, unless they absolutely needed to, which by all accounts, people just kept away from them. Okay. So they see two miraculous phenomena here. One, the demoniacs are healed, and two, the, this herd of, of pigs charges off, off the cliff. And the people come, and it's, it's the strangest ending to a, to a, a gospel. Because you imagine, this, this is fantastic, great. Two people have been healed, two people have been set free, given their lives back. And at this, the whole time sits out, the whole town sits out to meet Jesus. And you know, you're, you're kind of embracing it. This is going to be, this is going to be amazing. And you, know, you can imagine people falling at his feet and people thanking him and so on and so forth. The whole town sets out to meet him. And as soon as they saw him, they implored him to leave. Sorry, why? why? What? He just helped two people. He just gave them their lives back. But rather than be full of gratitude and maybe even awe, they want him gone. Similarly, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, some people, yes, uh, believe in him because of this, this sign, but scribes and Pharisees want him dead. So you have proof that there's something, maybe it's not, absolutely 100% clear that he's God, but there's definitely something special about him. There's, like He's working miracles here. This is worth looking into. There's something, there's something different here. But rather than delve into the mystery or try and use your reason to discover what's going on here, go. Leave. <coughs> and I, I think there's more of that in us than we might believe because... Uh, when it comes to, to embracing our faith or embracing a relationship with the Lord, I think there's a struggle in us, a struggle in our conscience, a struggle in our hearts that, that this relationship might start to change things in me. And maybe I don't want change. Maybe I want the world to change around me. So all them sinners out there, they, they, they should change. They should convert. Them bad people, them criminals, they should all stop what they're doing and wise up. Okay. 
So faith's like for, for all them people. I mean, Jesus should come and he should fix world poverty and fix world wars and, and all them things. It's, all, it's always kind of, you know, everything out, here, out there. Heal the, the sick people, okay. But the idea that, that the Lord would come into my life personally and change me, which, by the way, is the, kind of the only thing I have responsibility for, really, and the only thing I can really control is me. I can't control ye. I can suggest things, <laughs> but I can't control anyone. Anyway, the only one I have control over, hopefully, is me. The only person I really have to convert is, is, is me. So when it comes to our relationship with the Lord, it immediately gets personal. It, it, it's now about, about, it's about you and the Lord. It's about you and your faith, about your life, your pastimes, your hobbies, what you do on the weekend, what you watch on TV. Now it becomes, now it becomes personal. Now it becomes almost, I don't want to say invasive, but does, our, our conscience might think, whoa, if, if, I, if, I, if I let God in, things, things might change. And I, I don't want that. I don't want to lose control or the uh, control I think I have of my life. So, thanks, Lord. Um, it's great that you heal people. Just move along there, please. Because I'm not ready. I'm, I, I, don't actually, I don't actually want it. And it's, it's, it's a, such a sad reality. And, and not rare. Not rare. Remember, uh, St. Augustine uh, said very famously, the cost of obedience is small in comparison to the cost of disobedience. The cost of obedience is small in comparison to the cost of disobedience. That the cost of following the Lord, there is a certain cost, yes. But when you weigh up what the advantages are, what the, the repayment is, it's literally out of this world. Uh, the, the cost of obedience that there is, like uh, some of our young people, for example, when they go home, here they have a life of prayer, a life of friendship, <clears throat> a life of, uh, it's a good life, it, minimal, minimal stress. We don't have a stress life here at all. Uh, we have nothing to do all day, sure. Uh, we spend our day trying to find work. Um, so we, have a, we, we do have a good life, though. Okay, and then uh, the prayer is it's part of the program. So you wake up in the morning, we've got prayer in the morning and prayer in the evening. People pop into the chapel throughout the day. We've got good friendship, good, good mutual support. But then when they go home, now, now you're on your own, in a way. As in, yes, you can stay in contact via social media and so on and so forth, but ultimately what you do with your day is now, is now up to you. And that's, that's when it gets difficult. That's when it gets challenging. And then the friends say, oh, you're home, fantastic, haven't seen you in ages. Look, we have planned to go out drinking on Saturday. We're going to start at 6 o'clock in the morning, all right? Make sure we get a good long run of it, okay? And then uh, we spend the rest of the day staring into a toilet bowl, more than likely. It's going to be amazing. Do you want to join us? Now, you can just see how, like, the cost of obedience is small in comparison to the cost of disobedience. Saying no, what do you mean no? You've done this a million times before. You've always come out with us. But you say, well, no, I'm just, uh, okay, I found Jesus. <laughs> it's probably not going to happen. But no, I, I'm just not interested in that kind of thing anymore. Oh, you used to be so much fun. Look at you now. You know, and like in, in those moments, especially when you're, when you're younger and your friends are your world because you haven't moved away from home yet, haven't seen the rest of the world, this can be a huge sacrifice. To, to renounce the friendship, to renounce maybe your reputation. If your reputation was the party animal and now you've, you've changed that lifestyle, thank God. But now what's the, the, the repayment? The repayment is uh, no regrets, no shame and embarrassment. No, oh my goodness, what went up on Facebook last night and what happened with this relationship and was I unfaithful and all these kind of things and you skip all of that you keep your conscience intact and you have no regrets the cost of disobedience is small in comparison to the cost of disobedience when we follow the Lord when we like that there's there is true peace there there is true fulfillment there 
there is a vibrancy to our life that nothing else can give. Because we don't spend our life trying to hide from our consciences, from, our, from ourselves, from, from, from God, from anybody else. We don't, have, we don't have to put on masks to try and pretend that we're something. What you see is what you get. You have nothing to hide. So letting the Lord in. It comes at a, it comes at a cost, but a very, very small one in comparison to, to what we get. The blessing of living with the Lord within us, is, there's nothing like it. Like when you see a family where God is present, you see a couple where God is present, you see uh, a parish or uh, you see a group of people where, where the Lord is really present. Like, and there's, just, there's no place you'd rather be. So we ask the good Lord today as we remember the many martyrs who died for love of the Lord. And they, like us, didn't meet him in person. But they, were, they loved him so much, they were willing to give their lives for him. They very much lived out uh, to a much greater degree than we will ever have to. That the cost of following the Lord, for them it was, it was greater, much greater than, than what we have to pay or give. But for all eternity they have the crown of a martyr in heaven. And there's no doubt in my mind that for all eternity, they actually thank God for the privilege of being able to witness to their faith with their lives. From heaven, everything takes on a, a very different color, a very different perspective from up there. And so we thank the Lord for the gift of our faith. And we ask him for the grace whenever he knocks on our door, whenever he wants to be invited in to our lives, that we may never be impeded by fear that we may never say Lord we'd, we'd rather you move on to the next neighborhood that we may let him in and let him change us for the good for good Amen